Hi. I'm walking in front of you guys because this is a self-made video. First of all, my name is Anthony Gibbs. And before I begin, I need to thank several entities that, that made this humble thing possible. Um, first of all, I want to start with, Ish with Ishpeming a Public Library here in Ishpeming, Michigan. Um, the staff here has been wonderful in every single way. And I'm greatly appreciative of the opportunity to do this presentation here in the Ray Leverton Community Room in the basement of the library. Secondly, I want to thank uh, Marcus Robbins and the NMU the Archives for their for their help and for and for use of their materials. Uh, I want to thank the Ishpeming um, Historical Society, you know, for their insight uh, and for their information. I also like to thank, of course, the Salvation Army of Ishpeming, who were the inspiration for this project. Actually was, since it's, I'm speaking of it in a singular person. Ah, anyway, that's not important. I also want to thank my family, who were put up with me over this process. And um, that's about it. It's all who needs thanks. So you can see this here. This, this lecture is in uh, two parts. Part one, we're going to speak on the general uh, pattern of immigration from Sweden in the 1880s to the Americas, and a little bit of history of before that. We'll also talk about how this intersects with the Salvation Army in Ishpeming. And moreover, we'll discuss that what this really also implied was a large movement towards women and their rights, and their concerns. Let me gather some materials here. I'm going to keep talking, even though, even though you don't see me here for a second. Because this is like I'm in class, and I am your absent-minded professor. Here we go. This is a big kid in kindergarten here. has been involved in immigration to America since the 1600s. Many people kind of forget that Sweden at one time was a world power. During the time of Charles V and the uh, reigns and supremacy of the Habsburg Empire in Europe, in particular the Hildermann Empire, you had what was called the, the Thirty Years' War. And this was essentially a war between the Protestants and the Catholics on the continent. Yeah, yeah. Gustavus Adolphus jumped in essentially with the Protestants. And his forces and his actions, though he was killed in the process, helped assure that there was a peace settled between the Catholics and the Protestants. If he didn't jump in, the Catholics probably would have won that war and things would look quite different on the continent. And to, and to, and to object this power, the Swedes just like 
the British and the French and the Dutch did their own set of exploring in a new world during the time of the colonization. Here is one depiction, I'll put it to the camera close, of the uh, Swedes and their routes, if you're interested. So the Swedes were quite familiar with America. Starting in the 1840s and up to the years of the 19, I believe, 30, you had over a million Swedes arrive in America. Now, why did they come? You have standard factors, what we call a push and pull. I'm going to get this out of the way for a second here. You have economic factors. Um, more opportunity. You know what? Can you see this shit? many factors, push and pull factors, economics, opportunity, and sense of adventure. some of the main push and pull factors that led to large scale immigration between the years of 1840s up until the 1930s. So, you have many Swedes come to America. This is where they end up settling mainly. I'm going to go off camera here to go to a slide. Oh hell, you, you guys can see that can't you? I'm gonna pull it down here. Once again. As you can see, you know, Swedes over these years eventually ended up settling in the areas that are mainly red. And of course the gray areas represent being little to hardly any Swedes. If you notice, in the area where I live at currently, Many, many Swedes arrived here, and indeed I married a Swede, or a descendant of a Swede. So, I know my own family, this is an example. So many Swedes arrived here in this area, as well as Minnesota, and Chicago. And Chicago had more Swedes any place else in the world besides Stockholm at one point. And Swedes arrived for many different reasons, you know, um, farm, worked in the cities, worked in the mines here, in this area. Many, as I said before, with Minnesota, established farms. Many stayed in, um, over here in Wisconsin and established farms and did other things. Swedes also were very instrumental in setting up Things like uh, churches, you know, YMCA's, and those things, and it's, and they, and they, and they set up also Swedish language, you know, groups and things like that, so they wouldn't lose their language. And you can see evidence of this in Chicago, and um, and also um, evidence of many churches that were started in Wisconsin by the Swedes. And here, in our own Ishtamin, the Swedes 
in particular, the Swedish Salvation Army was instrumental in establishing the Citadel in this area. And along with uh, Cliffs uh, Mining and I believe the Swedish Lutheran Church, they combined their forces and they got the land and then they built the building. And it was there until it burned down. That's in, that's in a nutshell, like the Swedes and their migration. And Swedes also were involved um, in the infrastructure of America in the sense that there were Swedes who participated in the gold rush. There were Swedes that fought in, in the Civil War. Matter of fact, um, there, were, there were a few different officers that were of Swedish descent uh, who rose up pretty high in the uh, Union Army. And there were some Swedes, I believe, who also fought for the South, but not nearly as many as fought for the North. But that isn't the only uh, reason. You know what, I'm going to switch to a different slide. So obnoxious here. Here we go. That's not the only reason that Swedes arrived in this country during this time. We'll talk about the Salvation Army in particular here. It was started in 1865 by William Booth. As a matter of fact, one might argue that General Booth, you know, because it's the Army, and he wanted a paramilitary style organization to fight against degradation and poverty and godlessness, you know, among other things. So General Booth, along with his wife, and aren't I the sexist pig to not know his wife's name off the top of my head? Oh well. Along, it's not important what we're talking about here. It, <laughs> I know, right? I know, right? It's Great Anthony. The woman's name is not important, you chiseler. Nah, it's not anything that deep. As a matter of fact, I'll get her name right here. Her name is Catherine. They are the founders of the Salvation Army, in case y'all don't know. Okay? Now, the movement spread throughout Europe. And it spread to among the places Sweden. So, when it got to Sweden in the 1870s, there's something very important to consider here. What was also happening in the 1870s? In 1870s, I propose you had the beginnings of a worldwide women's movement. Now don't get it twisted. I'm not sitting here saying that women as a force kind of you know, coalesced and, uh, and became an army of righteousness and estrogen. No, no, no. Just 
just to kind of the general trends. 1870s, for example, you had people like Susan B. Anthony. In America, who essentially helped after a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and frankly, getting their butt beat out in the street. There are pictures of it. You, you can look up of her laying out in the street with her hands over her face. You can tell that she got her butt whooped. After, after a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, she managed to convince a member of the of the of uh, of Congress to to propose an amendment for women's suffrage, which did not get passed until 1919. Suffrage means only. So why is all this important to the Salvation Army, you might be asking. Why is it important? Well, let me show you. Show you these gals right here. I know your first thoughts are, holy crap, these are fun gals, right? Last we'll gal on Saturday night. Whee! Not really, hey. <laughs> right. But um, yeah, those are some holy rollers right there, Jack. Huzzah! Hallelujah! Coming through. Well, not probably not like that. They would probably were a little more restrained. But what are these women? What are they? They're ministers. It's pretty apparent. Pretty apparent. Look, if you, uh, the picture is kind of hard to see because it's bright, but they're wearing Salvation Army pins and lapels and uniforms. They're a little rock band for God. Bam! No, I'm only kidding. But, um, no, I said not kidding. They are a band for God. They're probably not a rock band. Anyway, <clears throat> These ladies are ministers, obviously. And um, and if you if you look at it, these ladies, more importantly, could do this in public. in the U.S. and Britain. That's an important distinction here to make. In Sweden, during this time, if you were a woman, you could not be a minister. That was straight up out of the question. They would throw your butt into, not jail necessarily, but an insane asylum. <laughs> Put your mind around that. At least in the South, when you was black, and you were and you were agitating for rights, or you were or you were or you're out of your place. They beat on you, they kill you, they curse you. But the very least, they, they weren't calling you just straight up crazy and dismissing you outright. Well, they, they were sometimes. But if you wanted to vote in 1889, Alabama. First of all, you're a brave man. And secondly, 
they wouldn't call you crazy for wanting to vote. Because one can understand why one would want to vote. They just can figure out your butt need to vote. So with these ladies, it's even deeper than that. It's even deeper than that. They were straight up told, you are out of your cotton picking mind thinking that you could be a minister. They would throw you in an asylum. They would, they would even imprison you. Hi. Sorry, we can hear you out there. Can you? Do you mind if I close this? Close that door, please. Apparently, I'm loud. All right, thank you. And, and library is shutting me down. <laughs> Free speech! Okay. Yay. All right. So, with that in mind, we see these ladies. These ladies are in direct defiance to many in the old world. And these ladies of the Salvation Army depict a subtle movement a change in the rights of women. For a long time for women, you were property of your father, then you became a property of your husband. If you didn't have one of those, you became property of your brother. You fast forward it to the 19th century, you had, you had a few more rights as a woman, but not too many. And women were told that you couldn't be this and you couldn't be that. You could be a wife, a mother, spinster. Maybe as a spinster, you could do a few different things. You know, you could be a washing woman or You know, you have some people who were like poets, some people who had other things, you know, people who were like writers, intellectual women, like things like that. But oftentimes, women like that either came from money and society that encouraging people to let them express their ideas freely, or they were women of extraordinary character who kind of clawed their way into expressing themselves freely. But all this was occurring around the same time. And these women of the Salvation Army were on the forefront of this. In the market historical um, records, the first Salvationists were seen, where the, you know, one well, of the first records of them was in 1888, here by the statue of Old Ish. And they would meet and sing songs and play guitar and those things by that statue. I immediately suspected as the boys were catching ships over here to get a job, you had many of these girls, especially the Salvation Army, who were following right behind them because they wanted a new opportunity. They wanted to redefine themselves. And let me just say, that's one of the beauties of America. Despite all of her troubles, women like this can come to define themselves as people. And not have to be a wife or a mother or a spinster. They can be a minister. That's pretty deep and powerful myself. I do. Let me conclude this. By tying this to we're going to stay in this area. Around the same time, 
This is a look at the first graduating class of North Michigan University at work. What do you see? Do some more here. What do you see there? You know, I'll move that damn thing up in the way here. Pull that down. Stop! What do you see? I see ladies. I see a lot of ladies. The first graduating class, I believe, was in 1880, no, 1899. Or open, and, and no, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. First graduate class was in 1900-something. Anyway, it was around the turn of the century. As we see here, turn of the century. So, 11 years, I'm going to pull this back up. Oh, look at that. Oh, hang it up, dude. Okay. So 11 years later, we see this. What does this mean? These are women who are going to have their own paycheck, find their own job, and define their own lives. Now, some might say, rightfully so, that back in that day, when you were a woman and a teacher, when you had a family, you had to quit. Maybe that's true. But what this also means is that you have women who at least know what it means to work, what it means to be on their own, and what it means to do their own thing. You have women who have learned to think for themselves and form their own thoughts. Many women, even at this point, was at home. And this notion is pretty advanced. I mean, hell, if you ask the Nazis, they was like, a woman is wife and mother. That's it. I mean, you even have around the world, right now, girls are not allowed to read. They're not allowed to be in school past the third or fourth grade, where they can just learn how to ask, track, divide, multiply, and basically read the Koran, probably, or whatever, to the mountain. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not the bag on Muslims. You know, as not mean that. So, so the movement of the Salvation Army ladies of Sweden to America. So they could be ministers, was part of an international women's movement. Where more and more women were being educated more and more allowed to define themselves than ever before. And sometimes, as Miss Anthony found, and as some of the ladies who were jailed, I'm sure, and the Sweden found, that was paid for in blood. 
So to conclude, we have a lot to thank the Swedes for here in here in in, in Ispami. We have a lot to thank the Swedes for across this country for the cultural contributions that they've made to our country. But the people we may have to thank the most are ladies just like this. Who risked everything for us. Who knows? If it wasn't for the holy rolling women sitting out there by the statue of old Ish, singing and praying up a storm, maybe there's no salvation army here in Ispame. These women who came from Sweden who risked imprisonment, who risked being committed, who gave up their lives just to share the gospel in equality and equanimity through that struggle. We have the Salvation Army of Ishtame. And I think, to conclude, one must really be in thankful awe that the Salvation Army, during the time when women were not being treated well by many people in the world society, gave them a chance. when many people would not. And they took that chance and they showed us that women would give it a chance to be leaders, can and will produce results. And results include an institution like the Salvation Army of Ishpami that's helped out thousands of people over the over 100 plus years of his existence here in Ishmael, as well as giving people an identity. So whenever you go to the Salvation Army and you get a meal, or you go there to get a little help, or you go to an event to help, just say a little thanks for these ladies right here, okay? All right. Y'all be good. Peace.